What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the quarantine zone again. This time we got round three with Sven of the Almighty Aborted. Great to be able to talk with you again. Thanks for being here. My pleasure, man. Hope things are good over there. All things are doing well, all things considered, you know, knocking on wood. But it's so awesome to have you here. Thank you for giving us some new aborted to go along with these very grim times with. we got Mania Cult out now. Was th the intention for this album to just be a direct continuation of Terror Vision? Do you consider this just like the sequel or picking up where you left off after that? Or was Mania Cult meant to be kind of like its own sort of standout thing? I think it's a sort of its own stand-up thing, uh, just like all our records. Um, it's definitely continuing some stuff of television where we're further delving into all the dark uh, elements in the music. It's definitely a darker record even than, than television. But at the same time, it's touching on a lot of different uh, aspects of, of music, and it's bringing back a lot of elements that... Uh, we haven't used uh, in a long time. So we, we tried to do a lot of different things throughout the record to create uh, as versatile a record as possible. Mm -hmm. What And also in 2020, you released uh, the EP La Grande Masquerade. And like, was that meant to be kind of like the preview or kind of like meant to hold people over while we waited for the anticipation of Mania Cult? It's just something that we wanted to do for fun. Uh, honestly, we were uh, playing festivals at the time, which I don't even remember what that's like. But yeah, we played festivals and uh, we we had a, a couple songs written, which were, uh, I, I think we just, we had one song left off of, uh, or a couple songs left off of Terror Vision. And there was one that we wanted to keep and do something with, uh, Funeral Malediction. Uh, and we figured let's do an EP, but let, let's make it as crazy as possible, super technical and super fast and just, you know, no reason, just complete insanity and, and just go, you know, take that approach. And that's something we could do with an EP because it's only three songs and it makes sense to, you know, go at it that way. I don't think it would work for an album because it would get very tiresome after a while. At least that's what I think. Yeah. Uh, so in, I don't think it was particularly something announcing the new record, more of something that we did for fun, just for fans. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, with Mania Cult, I thought, you know, it had everything we loved from, you know, uh, albums such as Terror Vision or Retro Gore or, you know, a Global Flatline, etc. But like, has there, have you always entered like the studio with like a preconceived idea of what you want each album to sound like? Or is there kind of like a lot of uh, experimentation or a lot of trial and error involved? I usually we just set an idea of, of what we want to do. And I think the idea this time was just like, write what, you know, what comes out, but also uh, we consciously decided to bring back some stuff and that we wanted to have a much more uh, dynamic record in Terror Vision, which is a, a very dense record from start to finish. So we wanted to have something which, which has a lot more breathing room. Uh, at the same time, up the ante on the extreme parts, uh, you know, make things more extreme, more technical in certain parts, but at the same time, leave more breathing room to, to other stuff so that the album is easier to digest. I think that was the main consensus. So we started writing, uh, I think in Pina Saudi was the first track that, that came out. Um, and then for the rest, uh, we wrote a bunch of songs and then there was definitely experimentation. There's some songs that didn't make it on the record uh, for various reasons, so yeah. Well, I know that like horror movies and you know just this concept of horror have always been like a influence to you in a way. So, and I've always thought like, you know, Mania Cult was interesting because I feel like that while that does have sort of like the horror movie uh, aspect behind it because, you know, the music is relentless and pulls no punches. But the term mania cult, I almost feel like that that's just a retrospective on humanity as well because, like, I feel like we are, as humans, just a cult who are addicted to the idea of danger and are always just like, you know, the, the new term nowadays is doom scrolling, like, you know, always scrolling for the worst possible news and stuff. I, if I, if you don't mind me asking, did everything that happened in the last year or so, the last almost two years, maybe influence how Mania Cult saw sort of, sort the of light of day? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's the, the whole metaphor behind the album title and the artwork. Uh, it, it's all about the crazy stuff that we've seen in the last couple of years. 
Uh, it's, you know, I don't like to preach. Uh, I think the band is here and, and music should be there to unite people. But the, the underlying topic is mental health issues and, and, and just the division that we have in, in society. And, you know, the, the fact that there's two factions and people can't seem to have a conversation and disagree and still be friends. It's a uh, biggest a problem. You look at social media or, or anything where media in general is, is promoting very uh, divisive posts or, or, or you know, they, they're just they're promoting stuff which is very polarizing yeah and that's why where you bring in you know the scroll of doom it's li literally what it is because you, you have much more chances to seeing that kind of garbage than you know seeing a post from a band or uh just something new from your friends it's just all being filtered out by this garbage that keeps on being shoved down our throats to you know make people hate each other more that's yeah. at least what it sounds like to me well, I've always loved because, uh, first off, you mentioned mental health, and uh, just recently I interviewed, and I know you've toured with them, I interviewed the vocalist of Benighted, and he works in the world of mental health as well, and, you know... He does, he doesn't wear shoes, he definitely has problems. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean... I'm kidding, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that, but, uh, yeah, like... Uh, but it's funny you mentioned that too, because you and I have heard multiple times in our lives, not to assume, but I know 100% that everybody in this industry has heard this once or twice, that metal, you know, encourages violence and promotes hatred and has all this. But the fucking media that we see, like, when they're, like, showing actual pictures of people getting blown up on TV are actually, like, you know, it's showing the most violent, gruesome stuff. And on top of that, promoting narratives that either encourage it or support the ideology that uh, fosters it like I I've always said that like the media does in a small scale on what artists and musicians or th no artists and musicians do in a small scale and what the media does in a large one exactly I mean how many times have you seen a metalhead shoot up you know a place or whatever it's it's I think it's funny that people still see metalheads or something like that I mean yes we we talk about violent uh topics uh but it's literally the musical form of, of what a horror movie is you know yeah it's it, it it's an outlet of anger and and like you said you just look around and and that's all the inspiration you need for that kind of stuff you know yeah i think it's because art you know we gravitate towards art when we're younger and you know like i couldn't have given two shits about what's on the news or what's happening in today's day and age really i mean i'm gonna sound kind of spoiled right now but you know i'm only i just turned 28 years old so this pandemic was really one of the first real catastrophes that i saw a direct impact as you know and like but so you know i'm watching the news and seeing all these discussions and everything like that i'm like wow this is like the most toxic shit i have ever seen in my life add social media to that and you're just in a constant state of toxic toxicity yeah it's uh it's it's sad to see that uh, that's all what it is you know that you you i think everybody would be a lot happier if they don't watch that shit <laughs> yeah and well and you know i was also talking um with a former teacher of mine and he says that like a lot of the polarization that we see from the media on social media or just in general is really tied back to our tribal and primatal instincts and these are just new mediums of executing it mm -hmm. that's an interesting take on it yeah so just a thought mm -hmm. maybe it was the absolutely when, when it came to the lyricism of this were you basically like was there a lot of research that goes involved i'd imagine that you like uh you know watched a lot of horror movies for the making of previous albums but were you kind of like you know watching the news a little bit more or like uh you know, uh, doing research through other mediums for the making of this particular album? I think looking at the situation for the last two years, probably a lot of people have been watching the news a lot more because, you know, that's where, you know, at least for Europe, I can say that that's the, the, the main spot you'd go every day because the, the, the whole regulations and rules and whatever would change sometimes daily over here. So the only way to know, like, all right, what I'm allowed to do today would be to watch the news, basically. Uh, and then, of course, you see all the other crap that's on there <laughs> and so forth. So um, did I do a lot of research? Not, not, not really. Did I watch a lot of horror movies for television? I mean, I always watch a lot of horror movies. So for me, it's not really 
I, I basically usually write about what's what's in front of my face and what's uh, interesting to me or uh, what bothers me. And I think on um, Mania Cult, I wrote about a lot of things that bothered me uh, that I saw around me. But of course, I you know I, I gave it the aborted sauce if you want to call it that, and gave it you know made it fit the whole horror universe. Because like like I said, I, I want this this band and music to be something that unites Peter people rather than you know divide them. Uh, and we greatly appreciate that because when we've seen you on Devastation on the Nation and the tour from 2018 with uh, Benighted and Hideous Divinity, like we, there was definitely a great essence of unity behind there, and we all greatly appreciate that has there ever been a time is it fair to say like because you know i've interviewed a cannibal corpse before and you know their music is not personal at all they just try to write the most gruesome shit has there ever been a time where your personal life whether it's an experience or something you're going through like is that uh has that ever influenced the lyricism as well or has music always just been a means of escape it's a means of escape mainly, but sometimes, you know, there's stuff that personal stuff that gets involved. Like when we, we did the La Grande Mascarade, the, the EP, uh, there's a definitely a couple songs on there that I needed to get out of my system. So, yeah, for that one, for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, I need to ask this because uh, this year is the 20 year anniversary of Engineering the Dead, the sophomore aborted album. Absolute classic. I mean, if you don't just mind me asking as sort of like a fan, uh, what was sort of like the mindset going into engineering the dead because you know that was the sophomore album you know it's like uh you know it didn't sound like a direct continuation of the purity of perversion but like i was just curious to what the thought process was from engineering the dead and how you moved forward from there well honestly engineering the dead we were just we were we were very young it was our first album on an actual proper record label so we were very excited about that and it was the first time that we actually had somewhat of a budget uh, to record. Uh, I think we just really took our time to, to compose the songs. Um, I, I think, you know, with the, the lineup that we had, we, we just had a lot more possibilities musically uh, to, to expand on what we had. And we wanted to create something much more aggressive and technical than, than what we had on, uh, on the purity of perversion. So it, it kind of went from there. It was recorded at the same studio, and then from there on, I think it just, that's where we started recording outside of Belgium, you know, for Gormageddon, and, and things kind of just expanded from there on. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I've noticed that the purity of perversion, like, sounded a lot more raw. It, it had what I called the debut innocence, or like the debut charm in a way, with the demos and stuff. But is there a chance that maybe, you know, when when touring officially picks up full swing again, that maybe we could get an Engineering the Dead, uh, you know, anniversary tour or something like that? Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, honestly, we, we've done that for Gormageddon, uh, where we played the entire album. We played like six exclusive shows. But... We play engineering the dead songs on, on our sets. We, you know, sometimes switch up whichever ones that there are, but honestly, we don't want to be one of those, uh, anniversary bands that, that, you know, keep grabbing back to their old records and that's sort of admitting to your fans that, yeah, that's the best thing we ever did. So we're just going to play that from now on and cash in on that. You know, we want to be a band that looks forward towards the future and we think we still have a lot to offer uh, with the new album, so we, we definitely, you know, if it gets to it, we can do a little something, but it will never be a full tour or a whole touring cycle just based on Engineering in the Dead or Gormageddon or any record because, you know, it, it had its time and we're still playing songs of it. I don't think it needs, you know, it, it, it got what it deserved back then. Well, maybe uh, what you maybe like I've always said that, and I agree with you that like I feel like, you know, like I I, I do love you know those anniversary album and full tours like I, you know, lost my shit when Fear Factory did Demanufacture, but like I could see what you mean on how like it almost you know if you're a band that has a lot of great new music to put out, you know why rely on previous uh, stuff? But it would be cool to maybe hear some like deep cuts uh, of that. Maybe that's like a cool yeah. way to celebrate, like play a song that you haven't played since the cycle for engineering the dead that's absolutely possible that's for sure 
Now, next year is the 10-year anniversary of Global Flatline. Uh, that was actually the album I discovered Aborted on um, because that was uh, one of my senior year of high school's uh, album releases. Um, if you don't mind me asking sort of like what the thought process was in 2012, you know, I mean, having, you know, this horror themed, maybe the world being predicted to end in 2012 may have been like an idea or something like that. 2012 was a crazy time. Yeah, I mean... <sighs> For that record, really, we, we just wanted to bring the band back where it should be because we had uh, the album that shall not be named before that, and I was absolutely not happy with that one. Uh, I've never hidden that fact. Uh, so for us, it was really just you know we wanted to 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 bring a, a good aborted record back you know to the table, which was a worthy follow up of uh, Gore Mageddon and uh, uh, RK Cabotor, for example. I think that that was the main goal here. Uh, I think that was, you know, for us, at least we're, we're happy with it uh, still till today. It's kind of crazy that you mentioned it's going to be 10 years old. I, I had no idea. I feel really old right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I do that with everybody I interview every time I ask like an anniversary question. I interviewed a, I interviewed a soil work uh, like last month and like I was telling him my favorite album. Oh, yeah, I was in fifth grade when that came out. And he was just like, oh, look, my other interviews online. I got to go. <laughs> So, but, um, but you know what, it, it's funny that you mentioned the, uh, with global flatline, the album previously to it, that shall not be named. I'm glad you're not naming it. Cause I can't even pronounce it either. So, uh, but, uh, don't worry about it. Nobody wants to, <laughs> but is it fair to say that like global flatline was almost kind of like a, a return to form for aborted in a way, or almost kind of like the new era? I think it was, it was a new start for the band and uh, that's actually when Ken got in the band and, you know, him and I have been the, the main constant for, well, 10 years, I, I guess now, or Ken joined in 2009, I want to say. So he's been in the band for 12 years now uh, and he's been writing most of the, the new material. So yeah, it's definitely been, you know, the, the second life of the band for sure. Now, kind of going back to like your songwriting process and lyrical inspiration, because obviously it's fair to say that it comes from external sources, whether it's, you know, other mediums of art, such as movies or through the media. Has there ever been a time, though, where like internally, where like an idea just spawned out of nowhere when you least expected it that later influenced the song? Do you mean lyrically or yeah. musically? Yeah, both lyrically or musically. Well, musically, you'd have to ask Ken. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's, you know, he's, he wrote the entire new record, so um, that's up to him. As far as lyrically goes, uh, that's a good question. I have to give that some thought. Um, like I said, on the Grand Masquerade, there were some, you know, internal struggle things that had to get out there. But other than that, it's usually, you know, it's whatever comes to mind that, that that's either bugging me or that I see that I think is really cool that, that gets tossed in there. Yeah, because I, I love having this discussion because it's always good when, you know, like we use we have this creative outlet uh, to stop things from, you know, pissing us off in a way or when but relying on that pissed off mentality in a way. Does that almost maybe make the songwriting process a little bit deteriorating in a way because you almost have to rely on this anger to to you know for your creative outlet in a way like do you feel like you can only write when you're angry no not really it's like i said it's not always anger it, it can be something that you think is really cool like for example uh drag me to hell on the new records is, is based on the on the movie of the same title um there's a lot of different things that, that you know it's not all bad and even if I'm writing about something that bugs me, it, it's not. It doesn't mean that I'm in an angry mood, you know. Yeah. It doesn't really. I'm pissed off that I can't play live shows for two years now. That <laughs> that's something else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm just gonna let you know that I'm staying out of your mosh pits when you do tour again for a while because I think that pent up energy. I, I, I'll be honest. I'm excited to see a boarded play again, but that <laughs> pent up energy you're keeping inside. I've already seen you a couple of times before. I'll be honest. I'm a little scared of how you're gonna tear the stage you're gonna leave every venue a smoldering <laughs> crater well here's hoping yeah and do you almost like and i also have to ask you this though because having so many albums out now does it get harder to put a set list together when you play live because i'd imagine oh yeah it 
Dude, it's a fight every time. Because <laughs> everybody wants to play. They, everyone has their own favorites, and we also we don't want to go out and only play new stuff because especially when it gets to places like let's say the us we don't necessarily come every year you know there's fans from different records and it would be disappointing for them to come over and only see us play new stuff for example so we want to always have enough variation uh and make sure that everybody's as happy as possible and have a diverse set as much as possible so always it's like we we kind of cap on each album how many songs of each album we want to play and then it gets to a fight of course i mean a friendly fight but it gets to arguments and you know i want to play that song and then the other guy wants to play that song and yeah. but yeah yeah it's <laughs> with that many albums in it's not easy that's for sure uh well if somebody begs you to play songs off of the album before global flatline are you just gonna say fuck no oh yeah <laughs> that's not even the two before global flatline do not get any live songs <laughs> that makes it already easier to you know pick some <laughs> fair enough but like uh yeah i mean having a like to make a set list together because i'd imagine and when there's some bands where they have like a different set list for every show but uh, with you guys do you have like a different set list every show or do you kind of like make one set list that would last for an entire tour no, we, we do one per tour. Uh, sometimes, you know, we have a couple of extra songs that we we have ready, and then we see, depending if, if some songs are go, go over well live or not, you know, we're going to switch them out. Because a lot of times we still play, like, even, let's say, we're playing a couple songs from the Necronic Manifesto. It doesn't mean that we're just going to pick the singles. Sometimes we get, we, you know, we pick some deep cuts. We'll play them, we'll learn them, and then if we see they don't go over well live, we'll just switch them out. So sometimes it'll be different from city to city, but in general, uh, it's one set list per tour, and the set list changes every tour. Mm -hmm. And the final question I wanted to ask you is I kind of want to nerd out a little bit on death metal in general with you because I feel like Aborted like, is not just a traditional death metal band. Like It's not just sounding like Cannibal Corpse or Morbid Angel. You also have like a technical death metal side to it. I see elements of maybe like Suffocation or you know modern day bands like Archspire. And even still, like I could see like At The Gates fans or Early In Flames fans like in the melodic death metal side behind you. When, when it came to, like, the sound of Aborted, like, I know it's, like, cliche to ask, what are your inspirations and stuff, but, like, was there, like, almost, like, a pinnacle record or a pinnacle movement that almost influenced the sound that Aborted would later take? There's a couple, honestly. Uh, I mean, for me, when, you know, when we started, I think one of the most important records for me was the Despise the Sun EP from Suffocation. That, that was... I think I've played that thing so much it must be broken now. Uh, absolutely fantastic record. Some of the best stuff they ever did, in my opinion. Um, Left Hand Path by Entombed, for example. You know, they, there's there's such a great atmosphere and, and hooks in the riffs and, and the production, everything just has something very unique to me. Uh, the drumming was also very special for that time, for, for at least for death metal. And then there's also, you know, the, the, the stuff outside of death metal, you know, Hate Breed was a band that, that always put on a fantastic live show. And same thing with Dying Fetus, you know, they, they kind of have, I don't want to compare Dying Fetus to Hate Breed, of course, but they have the, the same type of mosh riffs, if you want to call them that, yeah. and the same type of energy with the crowd. And, and I think those things are really instrumental when we started the band. Now, as time went on, you know, there's definitely a, a big influence of Carcass that joins later on in the band. Uh, and I think that's, you know, the more melodic aspects that came in. But, you know, as time goes on, there's much more influences that go in. The new modern bands, of course, also have an influence on us. Um, because we're, we're all still, you know, very much fans in the first place of, of the style of music. So we're all listening to whatever comes out today and, 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 and the bands that we tour with. So I think that there's just so many influences. It doesn't restrict to just that one album, you know. Yeah. I, I've always said that Aborted is the smorgasbord of death. So <laughs> I don't know what that is, but OK. <laughs> like a, a smorgasbord of death, like, you know, a buffet of different types of death, like, oh, a little bit of this, a little bit oh. of that. 
but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, being that you know uh, the purity of perversion came out in '99, the debut album, and you know starting a couple years prior to that, it, it almost seemed like a lot of different things were happening. You know, Gothenburg was taking off at that time. Uh, you know, black metal was on the rise in Norway. You had the metalcore movement on the East Coast starting to get its feet wet. So it almost seemed like that, like you guys were able to like appeal to multiple audiences, but you answered to nobody around you at the same time. Yeah, sort of. I mean, it's funny because I actually started this band because I think uh, in the late 90s, death metal was kind of on a dip, you know. The black metal, like you said, was getting really popular. And back then, I really wasn't into that stuff at all. So I started the band because I was like, screw this shit, I want to play some death metal. <laughs> so <laughs> that's basically really why this band started. And uh, now, of course, I, I appreciate a lot of different things. But yeah, hopefully, you know, we, we always try to do our own thing in a way, as, it, as is it, you know, musically or vocally or lyrically. And uh, hopefully, it, you know, it pays off or it paid off. It most certainly does. So uh, before we go, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Great to be able to talk with you again. Uh, is there just uh, anything else? Thank you. Is there just anything else with the border that you would like uh, to promote with the release of Mania Cult? Obviously, you know, thanks to this fucking virus that shall not be named. Obviously, you know, uh, tours are still out of the question. This is the second time throughout the pandemic I spoke to you, too, because I, I spoke to you right when the lockdown was first imposed for a second time. Um, that was before I had a computer that could take Zoom. But uh, is there just a... Uh, Anything else that you would like uh, to plug? Can we be expecting to see a border on the road anytime soon? Well, we're going on tour with our friends from Benighted, uh, the Acacia Strain, and a Belgian band called Fleddy Moculi in February, if, you know, everything happens. So that's the plan February, March. We're doing that. And then normally the States uh, next summer. Awesome. We look forward to having you back. But thank you so much, everybody. We are here with Aborted Mania Cult out now on Century Media. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time.